long ago, I promise you. A um, uh, couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, Sean Eves, if you have lost, lost your wallet, it is at the front desk at the conference center. Sean, did you, did you get it? I got it back. Okay, good. <laughs> now you know this was going to happen. You know this was bound to happen, but you know I got to swag sell you guys some swag now. They were like, can you go out and push it? I was like, yeah, sure, okay. okay. <laughs> so, you know, there are t-shirts for sale of the conference. You know, I have, let me just hold this up for you. You know, there are coffee cups, and there are greeting cards, and there are pens. There are these lovely, lovely pens, you guys. Um, so I pull it all out and show it to you in time. They said, just do your best caramel thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, right, okay. Uh, so the greeting cards, the cup, the pens. But you know what? Here's what's so cool about this. The pins have the cartoons by our incredible cartoonist, Mark Krauss. The pins say, I could be writing. They say, say uh, see a play, save a playwright. And they say, a production is worth a thousand workshops. have some stickies. They were like, push the stickies. Would you push the stickies? <laughs> yeah, okay, I mean, I'll try. I mean, how hard can you push a sticky? <laughs> anyway, that's the swag. And now I had to do it for you. <laughs> anyway, it's going to be on sale in the lobby. <laughs> now the commercial. It's going to be on sale in the lobby uh, of the hotel until right up to the national conversation. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know, there is, or for those of you who paid for this, there is a breakfast brunch tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock a.m. In, uh, in the ballroom. So that is happening if you've paid for it. And also tonight, the dinner after the national conversation is at about 9 o'clock. We just want to remind you. Um, I, I think there will be tickets on sale for those of you who have um, <clears throat> did not purchase it ahead of time. Um, after Julia's speech, there will be about a 15-minute intermission, and then we'll come back for the Q&A, allowing people to uh, get up to their other sessions. <coughs> I have great affection for this person. <coughs> Our final keynote speaker of the conference is one of our own. She is a teacher, a playwright, a council member, a thinker, a visionary, and as you've heard me say at least twice now that I can think of, a tireless advocate for every single one of you in the room. As we've seen with Molly Smith and Todd London, she sees beyond her own world and her own career to consider and recognize the needs of artists struggling right along beside her. Last year, when the New York theater community announced its roster of annual awards, she was struck by the lack of women represented in all disciplines. So in short order, she and Marcia Norman and Teresa Rebeck created the Lilly Awards, named after the playwright Lillian Hellman, and recognized in a very, very public way. In a ceremony, writers and directors, designers and producers who had remained unrecognized anywhere else. <clears throat> Unequivocally, she represents the needs of each of you in her committee and her council work at the Drama Skill. It is with great pleasure that I bring to the stage Julia Jordan.
minutes ago. I'm nervous. It's one in the morning, in the afternoon, and I've already popped a beta blocker and had a glass of wine to keep my hands from shaking. Which is to say, giving speeches and being any kind of leader of or public face for gender parity in the theater is not something that I was cut out to do. A few days ago, I panicked about this speech, and I called my teacher, theater mom, and friend, Marsha Norman, to beg her for advice. She's good at this kind of thing. She's Marsha Norman. <laughs> What could I possibly tell you that would be worth 45 minutes of a hot Saturday? She said, okay, here's how it goes. <laughs> she talks like that, straight to the point, boom, 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 done. So here's how it goes. This is who I am, a regular nice girl from Minnesota, just writing my plays, very nice and whatever. Because there was this one little problem I just kept pushing under the rug, but then I heard the voice of God. <laughs> and it told me, thou shalt face the problem under the rug, go forth and do good work. And so, yeah, that this is what I did, and this is what happened, conflict, 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 and then here we are. So what are we all going to do about it? <laughs> Perfect storytelling structure. <laughs> I am a nice girl from Minnesota, Minnesota, as my grandmother was before me. But I'm a nice writer girl from Minnesota who's always looking for a better story. And my grandmother, sto my grandmother has a better story than I do. So I'm going to tell you hers. I'm such a girl, I'm going to cry. <laughs> ago, with all of her mental faculties intact, at the age of 100. She had just finished her exercises, which meant slow dancing to Roy Orbison. <laughs> he was a singer that she discovered in her mid-90s. <laughs> she had only the lonely on a loop in her living room. She would get this spoony, rapturous look on her face whenever she heard his falsetto. She was a hundred-year-old girl with a crush on a pop star. <laughs> she called Mr. Orbison, quote, that young man with the beautiful voice. That's how old a hundred is. At a hundred, you think Roy Orbison is a young man. <laughs> she was not happy with me for informing her that he wasn't exactly young or alive. <laughs> Mary McCauley was born in 1910 on a farm in Minnesota. The land wasn't very good, it was part leech infested lake, part rock, and her dad had an act for buying dry dairy cows, which is to say they were dirt poor. The five children of the family and my grandmother's mother ended up working the farm while her, while her father picked up jobs as a janitor in Minneapolis to supplement their income. My grandmother hated the farm. She would tell stories about the itchy wool stockings her mother would make the girls wear in their arms so while they were out in the field in a hundred degree heat, all in an attempt keep their skin white so people in town wouldn't think they were country. Hating farm life, my grandmother never understood the concept of pets. Animals inside a house disgusted her. <laughs> she never learned any of our pets' names. She referred to them all as that damned cat, or that damned dog, or that damned rodent, or damned fish. Basically damned, and then the designated, she designated the species of the genus that the creature belonged to. <laughs> Animals belonged in barns, and if you didn't have a barn, fantastic. You didn't have to take care of or clean up after any animals. She also didn't understand farmer's markets. Or why would anyone want to shop outside? What if it rained? And she would never sew. She would refuse to sew a button back on her own blouse. I remember as a kid, I wanted one, a little pink plastic sewing machine. I'm not quite sure why. I think my friend had one and her mom sewed. My mom, my grandmother's daughter, definitely did not sew. In any case, I must have told my grandmother that I was hoping for a sewing machine for Christmas because I clearly remember the lecture she gave me. I was not to learn how to sew because if I did, people would take advantage and have me fixing every little tear for them and not paying me to do it. If your shirt tore, what you did was you went to work in an office behind a desk, you wore nice clean clothes, a skirt that fell to just below the knee, no higher because that looked cheap, and no lower because you never know when someone might want to take you dancing, and you wore lipstick and heels, always heels, and in that nice shiny office dressed like that, you earned the money you need to buy a damn new shirt. <laughs> All this is to say that 
my grandma was poor. She was country poor. She was girl country poor. And she was determined not to be. My grandma's two brothers were sent to free public schools, but afraid that his daughter's virginity would be in jeopardy in the wilds of public schooling circa 1920, my great-grandfather managed to enroll his three daughters in Catholic school. Exactly how he managed that was revealed on their graduation days. Rolled up inside their diplomas was a bill for their entire grade and high school educations. After she graduated, Mary hightailed it out of Minnesota for the big city of Chicago, learned how to type really, really fast, got a job in an office, cut her hair short, went out dancing a lot, and paid off every cent of her schooling. She met my grandfather, fell in love, and the depression, and the depression hit. Her father lost his janitor job, her brothers were unemployed, and the farm was as unproductive as ever. They couldn't pay the mortgage. So my grandmother did. For six years, she paid for the piece of land she hated the one she couldn't wait to get away from. For six years, she put off her marriage to my grandfather because she would have lost her job if she married him. And her family would have been homeless. A woman couldn't keep her job if her husband had one at times that hard. And she swore to me that she did not sleep with my grandfather in all that time for six years. <laughs> she was a nice Catholic girl from Minnesota after all. So the Macaulay's kept the farm, the depression ended, my grandparents married and were gloriously happy and had five children, and then one day, when my mom was 16, and the youngest was six, my grandfather dropped the children off at school on the way to take my grandma to her brand new office job. And he suffered a massive heart attack and died. Leaving her with five kids, no insurance, no savings, and only partially paid for a house. Meanwhile, back in Minnesota, that crappy old farmland was about to become one of the wealthiest suburbs of Minneapolis. <laughs> and a few years later, when Mary was struggling her hardest to get my mom into college and get food in the other children's mouths, her father passed away, and in this will, he divided the land into three parcels, one third to each of her sons, and the remaining third the unbuildable swamp land he willed to his three daughters to split. A few years after that, my grandmother's older brother died and left the great land and all that money to his wife, so a woman got it anyway. A Swedish woman, and my great-grandfather was sexist and racist against Swedes for some reason. <laughs> so she slogged on, got all her kids to college on one scholarship or another, and their children have and their children have attended nearly every like Ivy League institution in the country. Somewhere in the 70s, my grandma married the boss of her last office job. He was a sweet, funny man and a great salesman, but he made some crazy investments with his larger paycheck, and she made some extremely wise ones with her smaller ones, so by the end of his life, she was financially supporting him. Which does make you wonder who was really running the office all those years. <laughs> My grandmother's story to me is epic. It's tragic and triumphant and important because it's not unique. I think about what it must have been like for her to look into the faces of five children and have to get up and go to work and be underpaid, as we all know she was and women still are. If she was a man, it would have, she would have been a salesman, not a secretary. And things would have been hard, but not as hard, not nearly as hard. Never mind starting her adult life with debt that her brothers didn't incur, never mind the land, never mind the will. So that's who I am, the granddaughter of that woman. And I'm complaining that my career my theater career isn't exactly where it should be. <laughs> it really does seem unseemly. <laughs> that said, I have never given an interview to promote a play where the headline and the bulk of the article didn't focus on the fact that I was a female writer who was actually getting a production. <laughs> I've had artistic directors of Tony Award winning regional theaters tell me to my face that they'd be more likely to produce my work if I wrote a play with a male lead because that's what audiences prefer. There's ample evidence that the opposite is true, by the way, but as Charles Isherwood just pointed out in the New York Times, Broadway producers haven't yet noticed. I've watched my male and female co contemporaries forge extremely different paths. I've been out of school nearly 20 years now, and I look around at the writing group we started so long ago, whose members have come and gone and been added to, but we're all about the same age, and we all have been writing about the same time, and we all started with the same credentials. We've all won awards, and we all respect each other as equals. We drag ourselves out on Wednesday nights, year after year, to hear what the rest of the group thinks about what we slogged out the night before. 
but it's impossible not to note that the majority of the male writers are actually making a living writing scripts in theater, TV, and film. They often have productions lined up for work they haven't yet finished writing. And the women are writing on the side of their money jobs, and they're often worried about whether they can continue to afford their apartments, and they have piles of scripts and drawers that no one will read. The careers of male writers seem to be relatively impervious after a series of plays received not so hot reviews. Female writers' careers seem to end before they begin if they don't have a great, big, huge, juicy hit in the first few years of their careers. And these are your privileged Juilliard and Yale grads with fancy agents. This is the kind of stuff we women have been bitching about in private for years. And it has felt very good to bitch in private. It felt really good to have others tell me that I wasn't crazy. But I used to cringe when the subject came up with male writers around. I preferred the problem to stay under the rug, to be pulled out only on certain female-centered occasions, preferably where cocktails were being served. <laughs> but then I heard the voice of God. <laughs> So then I heard the voice of God, if God is Sarah Shulman. Sarah Facebooked me three years ago, saying that for her birthday, she wanted to get a whole bunch of female writers together, and I thought, fantastic girl cocktail party. Let the bitching begin. We have, we have different circles of friends. She'd meet mine, I'd meet hers. But then she sent me a list of theaters that were producing zero women in their upcoming season, and the list was longer than usual. Women were being produced in less than the one in five slots to which we were accustomed. I'm so tired of the phrase, but it was the tipping point for me. I firmly believed that if the percentage of plays by women had stayed above the 17 to 20 percent mark, I would have kept my mouth shut, in public anyway. Sad but true. Before that year, I listened and honestly considered and factored in all the arguments about established writers being overwhelmingly male, that male artistic directors were simply more drawn to male work, that male writers write more dramatically, women more poetically, and drama in all bold caps is more commercial than poetry and flowering script. That things would get better in the future when more women were artistic directors and more girls had worked their way up through the ranks. That's what they were saying when I was a student at Juilliard. I'm now a teacher at Barnard in Columbia. A lot of time has passed. And the one in five slot has been standardized for all that time. There has been a jump in the numbers of female productions in the last two years in New York City, but I have no reason to believe there is a jump nationally, and frankly, the New York numbers have already begun to wind their way down again. So after Sarah's Facebooking me, I reread my 2001 NISCA report that put female writers at 17% of national productions, and I found TCG's list of the top 10 plays, which should really be called the list of most often produced plays, and I found that though women only wrote 70% of the plays that got first productions, when you looked at the top two plays that received the most productions around the country the following year, they held double that percentage. My date to my high school senior Valentine's Day dance just happened to have been Freakonomics economist Stephen Lovett. <laughs> so I called him and I asked him if I had single-handedly proven bias at the, in the American theater at my own kitchen table that morning. And he said no. But then you might be able to find someone with more sophisticated tools and a trained mind to take a look at the situation. Meanwhile, I was Googling away bias in the arts. And I kept coming across Cecilia Rouse and Claudia Golden's landmark study of blind auditions, orchestrating impartiality, which showed that when the orchestras, concerned about allegations of racism, began holding auditions behind screens, not only did musicians of color begin to win seats, but so did women, and men and women who didn't have fancy schools and mentors behind them. Cecilia was very easy to find. Professor at Princeton, email on the university website, I wrote her an email asking her if she would talk me through the finer points of her study over lunch. She agreed to, and we set a date. But before we could even get together, I got another note for her, from her. Her star student, Emily Sands, had just re returned from the University of Chicago, where Steve Levitt was trying to persuade her to come for her grad studies instead of to Harvard or Yale or Princeton. There was a huge war over this young talent. Steve had mentioned my little findings to Emily and suggested it as a possible thesis subject. She had come back to Princeton intent on pursuing it, and Cecilia had put two and two together. Emily, Sherry Wilner, joined Cecilia and I, 
and Ed Sherry joined Cecilia and I for lunch a week later, and Emily Sands then got to work. She did three studies and one thesis. The first was about supply. Every time stats come out showing that women are underrepresented, underrepresented in journals, theaters, museums, the question always comes up about supply. Are female artists applying? Are they even present in the same numbers as men? And almost always the answer is, sorry ladies, the answer is no. No, they're not. At least they're not showing up in the databases in any numbers larger than the theaters are reporting they send in their scripts. In a town hall that was held in New York City a few months before, the artistic directors held forth that, the, that most received about 30% of their scripts from women. Emily looked at Dooley, the online database, and the Dramatist Guild membership and found that in both, only about 30% of their writers were female. When Emily's thesis came out, she said, um, and she said exactly that, there was a huge outcry from women. The Dooley website is like Wikipedia. Produced plays are logged by others, but unproduced plays must be logged in by the only people who know they exist, the writers themselves. Maybe women don't go on Dooley. Maybe they don't join guilds if they aren't produced playwrights. Maybe. Emily didn't offer proof. She offered findings. And she found that the 30% that the artistic directors reported was mirrored almost exactly in Dooley and the Guild. I do think it makes sense that people who actively log their unproduced plays at Dooley are the same people who are actively sending their unsolicited scripts to the theaters. But a lot of women don't like that theory. It doesn't match up with their observations, and it seems to disprove their, their assertion that bias is at play. But it doesn't. They shouldn't even be surprised by it. Discouraged workers are always found when bias is in play. Women are human. Humans tend to make decisions in their best economic interest. And at some point, males and females have to adjust their playwriting dreams to the reality that they also need to keep roofs over their heads and food in their mouths. And as hard as it is for men to do that as playwrights, it's even harder for women. And so the attrition rate is steeper than that of men, therefore less supply. The second part of Emily's work was the audit study, where she had four scripts read by artistic directors and literary managers across the country. Now, I'm going to try to clear up something once and for all that the papers got wrong over and over again. She found that whether scripts were purportedly written by men or women, the participants judged them to be of equal artistic value. There was no bias at all found on the subject of excellence. But, she also found that female respondents believed that audiences would buy fewer tickets, plays would receive more negative reviews, top talent would be harder to attract, artistic directors would not want to produce, and that ultimately plays by women that they believed were by women were not fits with their theater's mission. If the exact same script carried a male pen name, it was not thought to have any such challenges. I'm sure we're going to talk about this later in the panel, as this finding caused the greatest ruckus amongst women interested in parody. The simple answer, it's impossible to prove a null hypothesis. Finding no bias on the part of men means nothing. If I sent you out into the world to find an undiscovered species and you returned a few days later and said, I didn't find any, you can't conclude that there aren't any out there. <laughs> And in turn, if you did return with a strange new bug in the palm of your hand, all that we can conclude is that when you set out, there was at least one undiscovered bug out there. So what we can conclude from section B of Emily's thesis is that she found bias against female work, a really interesting kind of bias that may suggest a self-fulfilling prophecy on the part of theater women, or may suggest that women in theater are simply reporting honestly what they see and know to be true. Or, most likely, in my opinion, some combination of the two. I couldn't help but notice in all the angry postings and comments from female respondents that hit the blogosphere in the days after the study's release, that they were, they were not aware that they had given high artistic marks but predicted low economic return on the, what they thought were female written scripts. They seemed oblivious to it. And yes, the sample size was big enough, and the findings were so stark that they reached the highest degree of significance that the field of economics recognizes. Meaning that you could redo that study over and over again under perfect circumstances, you would get the same result at least 95 out of 100 times. The 
third study of the Sands thesis was the Broadway study. This is the one that brought out all sorts of armchair st statisticians. Basically, like myself, basically <laughs> Emily looked at the last 10 years of Broadway plays, threw out the outliers and plays whose entire runs were not inclusive, and as the numbers were not publicly available as to the cost of mounting each individual production, she judged plays against plays, musicals against musicals, and one person chose against the, against the same. And she found that works by women made an average of 18% more per week, and yet still had shorter runs than plays by men. This is the strongest evidence of bias in economic terms. It's in the numbers. Producers do not act in their own economic best interest when they close shows that are more profitable than the ones that they keep open. They are therefore acting on bias. The complaint about this study was in the assumption that had to be made that all plays cost the same, that all musicals cost the same. Of course they don't. But remember that the female written plays made an average of 18% on average week by week. The only way that finding is meaningless is if the average play by woman cost at least 18% more to mount. This is where we might just want to take a look around and remember that it's been established many, many times over and over again that work by women is generally produced on smaller stages and that plays by women that reach production have smaller casts than plays by men. So Emily's findings paint a portrait of what happens to women's scripts, bias and discouragement circling. Women dominate theater in high school and college. About the same numbers pursue graduate playwriting degrees. Agents, 50-50, agents rep under 40% female clients. Those are the good agents who would give me those numbers. Theaters report 30% of the scripts are submitted by females. And then the theaters in turn produce just under 20%. That's what happens to female writers, attrition. Intelligent, educated, aware people are still talking about merit. That artistic directors need to choose work based on their assessment of merit alone. Does that mean that if an artistic director is convinced that work by white artists is inherently superior to work by artists of color, that he or she has the right to run a nonprofit, tax free, grant receiving theater for white artists only? Can we not see through history how incredibly crappy human beings are at determining merit? <laughs> Broadway season 100 years ago, I didn't recognize one title and I recognized only one name, and I'm a theater nut. The wrong movie wins the best Oscar all the time, we know this. Mm -hmm. Arguing about marriage is silly. My grandmother never complained about her history. She never even told me about it, my mother did. The only anger I ever saw in my grandmother was over the six years that she lost with my grandfather. She regretted not sleeping with him. <laughs> the money, the land, the secretary, salesman, she overcame all that in the end, but during must have been excruciating. My mom cries when she remembers, but I never saw my grandma cry about it, never. So here I am with a husband who's as good at changing a diaper as I am. He's out with him right now. <laughs> and a father who has done nothing but encourage and support me unconditionally. And as far as my career goes, most of my plays actually have been produced. And I do make kind of a living. So what do I have to cry about? I remind myself constantly, as we all need to, that I'm not whining about my career. I can't. None of my statistics or any of the studies prove anything at all about anyone's individual career. We're all combinations of talent, advantage, right place at right time, happenstance, luck, determination. But a young female playwright who lives in New York City has a huge advantage in finding a production over a young male, oh, sorry, a young female playwright who lives in New York City does have a huge advantage in finding a production over a young male writer in Boise. But if both leave Boise and head for the big city to work as artists in any field, not just playwriting, acting, directing, painting, dance, poetry, filming, conduct, conducting, any field at all, if you were to bet who would be more likely to make a career out of it, you would be ignorant and foolish to bet on the woman. In any field, that is, except for that of a musician in an orchestra which holds its auditions behind screens specifically to, hold, to hide the race and gender of the applicant. So is the plight of the female playwright really that epic or tra tragic in the great scheme of things? 
The fact that one in five productions is written by a woman in a good year is, well, it's just a tiny little corner of a problem, a small piece that in reality only a small number of people even think, much less care about. But it is a piece of an epic, tragic, contemporary problem, a travesty that permeates the whole globe. And it does seem that at this point in history, forces are coming together from its many, many corners, large and small, to address the state of women in the world. The American theater is our corner, our piece of the world, and it's ours to fix. And by working to put more stories by women on more stages, we will help in the best way we can to redefine in the audience's mind who and what women have always been, are, and can be.